more than three of you. I have given this talk in a room of three people, so hopefully, uh, <laughs> Did they that was, it? no, they had a lot of trouble, but, but we got to work back and forth and figure it out. Anyway, so uh, you're here to learn Elasticsearch. Uh, I've got 50 minutes, I believe, so uh, we'll see if I can fit an hour-long talk within 50 minutes. Hi, my name is John Berryman. Uh, just to do a quick introduction to myself, um, you know, find me on Twitter. A lot of my self-worth is derived from my Twitter followers. Um, <laughs> I, I was a, <laughs> I was a, so growing up, I was a pretty, pretty nerdy kid that uh, started reading programming manuals when I was in like the first grade, ended up uh, getting into aerospace engineering, that was my first career, uh, decided that uh, satellites and, and all that stuff were pretty cool, but I liked the programming and I liked the math. So I moved a, a, after about four years in the field, I got into search technology and I was consultant, I wrote a book. That guy right there wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that with your life, but uh, it, it's a good calling card. And uh, now I work at Eventbrite. I am a discovery engineer, so search and recommendations and stuff like that. So uh, to give you a little preview of what we're going to talk about, this is not really an advertisement for Elasticsearch, but what a, a lot of what we're doing involves my mental model thinking through the, last, the uh, Eventbrite uh, problem. So uh, just to give you a little shared background, uh, historically, the, the company I work at, Eventbrite, has been a very organizer-focused um, startup. We, we allow organizers who want to put on their own events to come to our website. You can build a nice little web page with uh, little effort expended. You can sell tickets. We take care of all the credit card mess. Uh, you, can, you have a platform for messaging attendees. And we gather metrics. So like after the event is done, you get to look back and, and make sure that your next events are uh, as good or better than the, this event. But uh, after years of actually nailing down this side of the market pretty well, uh, my company realized that, look, we've got all this inventory. Everyone, we're basically white labeled, but everyone is plastering their events on our website. If we can turn around and sell our inventory to everyone else, then organizers are happy. Uh, the customers are happy because you can find something to do over the weekend. And we're hoping to, to generate kind of a, the, the so-called flywheel effect. And this is exciting for me because this is where I belong. Uh, is creating the marketplace is all about building search and browsing and recommendation uh, features for Eventbrite. And of course, uh, this technology is based on Elasticsearch, what we're talking about today. But uh, can you guys keep a secret? No. So I know I know we we're supposed to talk about Elasticsearch today, but I I, I got to tell you I'm actually more interested in talking about my new startup, Event Dark. <laughs> yep. So don't tell anybody, but I'm going to directly start competing against Event Right. Uh, and our, our guiding principles, and I am sorry to do this to you. I know we're supposed to talk about Elasticsearch, but Elasticsearch is hard. So I'm gonna focus this new startup, and you guys can join me if you'd like. It's going to be focused on MySQL because everyone knows how databases work. Databases are easy. Uh, and let's just, let's just build on a tried and true platform, and let's not overthink it. And our specialty, because I found a free uh, data thing online, is uh, cat-related events. We we'll start at cat-related events. Good. See, we have some attendees already. And then we'll expand other fields. All right, we, we have someone who will at least buy our tickets. So we have a marketplace. Excellent. All right, so building this new website is going to be pretty easy. There's not really too much to an event. So here's our schema with uh, MySQL. We're going to have IDs, uh, an integer, uh, name, description, city, start date. You can look at all that. That makes pretty good, simple sense, right? And my hypothesis that I know will play out well is that we can build a website based on this. So, uh, and I'll demonstrate it. Um, so, here, here's our event search. Select star from events, that gives us all the details we'll need back for the website. Uh, we have date range search, obviously you'll need that to find something this weekend. Uh, we have geo search, not hard, why invest in all that stuff, we can just do string matching. And finally, uh, it's easy to search for events that you like. So, I want to find an event uh, where the name equals cat. And the results are, Nothing. Oh, so this is interactive part. 
why do you think might there might not be any results for that particular MySQL query? Yeah, okay, so that, that's a little problem. I, it's, I could spell cat with misspellings. These are all, you guys are overloading my brain, but I, I think we can still make this work out. Now, you guys can't spoil all my slides before I get to them, all right? <laughs> so the, the particular problem here is probably no one's going to, to the first answer, no one's probably going to name their event cat. Would you like to come to see cat? <laughs> so, uh, but, okay, so MySQL, it, MySQL solves this for us. Woo. Uh, we can use a like query, like percent cat percent, and the results come back is... Yeah, teach your cat to knit, an evening of cat bowling and BYOC cat dance party. This is, we're on board. So, uh, okay, so that, that was just a, a, a silly uh, thing just to show you uh, that we can probably accomplish this. Um, let's get more serious with a more serious query. Someone's likely to be looking for a cat farming seminar. Um, so we're going to help them. Do <laughs> what? Not in a bad way. <laughs> that might have particular meaning to you that it doesn't to most of my audiences. <laughs> so, no, not that event. So, anyways, um, so how do we look? How do we search for this? If someone comes to our website and they look for a cat farming seminar, select star from events for name like percent. Cat farming seminar. Results? Well, it's, it's in red, which that, that's the thing I would like to match, but it doesn't match. Interactive time. What have I done wrong now? Case. That's right, right, right. Uh, uh, MySQL is all uppity about case, so this is also not hard. Um, all we have to do is whatever the people type to us, we lowercase it, and uh, it'll still work. Cat farming seminars. Okay, great, that matches. But seminar for farming of cats, not such a match. Uh, anyone have any ideas how I can deal with this one? Cats or farming? Well, let's try and. I, I want to make sure. Yeah, so, okay, so let's do something like this. Good idea, good idea. And, uh, well, it's starting to itch me a little bit because. I heard that like is not as efficient of a query as just like a, a pure match. I, but surely not, right? And we're doing it three times, so it's kind of like scanning every document in the database three times, right? But we'll probably shard it, uh, and that scale will be fine, I'm sure. So anyways, we do indeed match that. Seminar for Farming of Cats, but we don't yet match making a cat farm the seminar. And now you're totally in my head because I didn't realize that this was a potentially derogatory thing. Making a cat farm <laughs> <laughs> the seminar. Uh, why, so why does, why does that one not match? Farming. farming and far Well, but they're the same thing, right? Yeah, so, so it's like I, with search technologies, they do a pretty good job about understanding uh, language. And I, I guess we'll have to like cut off the ends of the words. So farming, farm, at least that'll match farmer, farms, that'll match other stuff. And we indeed, indeed do get back the results we want. Uh, starting to poke some holes in my little theory here, though. Uh, uh, this is an old presentation. <laughs> Are you telling me I should retire my presentation after this time? Oh, yes, you're right. Okay, so I should have updated the dates on my examples on my slide for Mr. Michael Handler in the front row. <laughs> um, so uh, next one, cat farm class. Um, doesn't match either. It's a class. It's kind of like a little mini seminar. In order to make that work, I'm going to have to do, I, I, what am I going to have to do for that one? 
Oh, okay, okay. It doesn't match all the terms, uh, but at least if it matches like a couple of them, that should be good enough, right? So I'll replace my ands with ors to someone's suggestion earlier. Uh, and what happens? I do indeed match everything I want, and I match all these things I don't want. And since there's no notion of which match is better than the other match, yeah, all the stuff, all the stuff with a cat event goes to the top, and this is the whole thing's about cat events. So, guys, I think I think we're sunk. I apologize for taking you through this startup with me, uh, but databases are very good at some things, uh, but search engines and search technology are very good at a different set of things. In particular, search engines are quite good at finding documents that not only just match exactly what you have, but contain specific tokens and phrases of the tokens uh, and different mutations of the tokens. They understand English in, in a way that I, I think you'll understand uh, when, we, when you leave here. Uh, scoring and sorting of documents. Uh, my SQL finds the set that matches, whereas Elasticsearch, as we'll see in a little bit, uh, you can put into it an understanding of how good or bad a match is to uh, particular search terms. Uh, and finally, this is something that both uh, MySQL and uh, Elasticsearch are good at, but it's, it's become an interesting, more recent use case with search technologies. Searches are actually really good for filtering, grouping, and aggregating data. So search engines uh, came out of information retrieval field, but they're being used more and more for like log analytics and stuff like that. And we'll touch on that right at the end. All right, so now since we've failed, uh, let's, let's go ahead and get back to the main talk that you guys got, came here for. Uh, we're gonna teach about Elasticsearch, and in the next 30 minutes, uh, we'll do a really quick and dirty application. I'll show you how to uh, pull down Elasticsearch, create an index, index stuff, and retrieve it. Uh, we'll take a peek under the hood so that you can see the data structures and algorithms in place. Uh, fortunately, this, the data model for Elasticsearch is simple, simple enough that you can leave with a basic understanding of it. And we'll get, as I promised, we'll get into some of the data aggregation stuff that Elasticsearch has been used more recently for. And then we'll have, hopefully, a little time for questions. Uh, what, in particular, I want you guys to get out of this uh, is a couple of meta goals. One, I want you to see me using uh, the very basic implementation of Elasticsearch, and I want it to be approachable for you guys. So it's a tool on your shelf that you can grab for and learn more about when you need it. The second thing, and I encourage you to do this with any technology, uh, any data store technology that you want to use, I want to impart an intuition about how these data structures work and what they're good at and a little bit about what they're not good at. This, this means that when you reach the shelf to get your tool, you, you actually get the right tool. So building a basic search app is not that hard. Um, and, and you can get, uh, I'd say for, there's a lot of tuning that comes with Elasticsearch and getting the, the behavior and the relevance, notion of relevance just right. But getting the thing out of the box and turning it on, it'll actually get you about 50% of the way there. So it's, it's, a, it's a real quick technology to get up and running and, and get some good results. In order to install and run Elasticsearch, uh, this is pretty easy. You, you all probably know what wget is. So you can pull down uh, the find your favorite mirror, pull down Elasticsearch. In this case, it's a, I, I, need to, I do need to update my notes here. It's a little bit older version of Elasticsearch. Uh, but pull it down, unzip it to whatever, wherever you want it to live, cd into that directory, and then start the uh, binary, bin slash Elasticsearch. Uh, once you do that, you can just curl localhost at the Elasticsearch port 9200, and it tells you, hey, you know, for search, like in case you forgot that it was for search. Uh, but Elasticsearch is now up and running. And just like with MySQL, uh, with Elasticsearch, you will want to think in advance about the type of data that you're going to be interacting with and build a schema for it, or as they say in Elasticsearch, a mapping. Now, Elasticsearch is interesting here because early on they advertised that they were a schemaless data store in the age where MongoDB was rocketing off. Everyone was kind of tack tacking onto this. And it's, it was true uh, to an extent that you could just start dumping information into Elasticsearch. Uh, and that gained Elasticsearch a lot of popularity, but it's still kind of an anti-pattern. 
So it, in my opinion, uh, over years uh, using this technology, it's still very important to, to think through what you're getting ready to do with this thing. So uh, setting up the mapping is, is simple. Everything in Elasticsearch is a JSON uh, interface. And in this particular, uh, this is a Python conference. Uh, so every example that you'll see here, uh, I am using the, the Python client. But it's, it's really nice. It's really a fairly thin uh, layer over the JSON interface of Elasticsearch. So uh, when you're setting up a schema, all you have to do is specify uh, the fields that you're going to have. In this case, ID, name, description, city, start date, price. And you get all of the things that you would typically think of existing in, uh, in a, a data store. So you have uh, numbers, integers, floats, uh, strings, um, dates. It's actually, so you, you can start to get more complex things like dates. You can get locations that are a little bit more aware than uh, you know, just two numbers. It knows what a location is. And, but one thing I'll be focusing on is uh, not only can you have strings, but you can say that your strings are special in some way. For example, an ID is a type of string, but it is a string that is not analyzed. That means that we're not going to do any special, special massaging and, and uh, trying to understand this as in a string from natural language. However, both the name and the description here I've marked as having an analyzer that is English. Uh, so this is me giving Elasticsearch a hint that not only is this blob of te of bytes actually text, but it's text of uh, English. And and I'll show you what that means to Elasticsearch in a little bit. But it's interesting because you don't have to put English here. You can put Chinese or Japanese or any language, most any language that you'd want, and you can make up your own stuff. So there's interesting things that you can extra rules you can put in for like if you have uh, camel case strings because you're indexing programming languages. You can break that up and make your own analysis chain for it. Um, and then, of course, you, uh, here's me using the client. You create event rights uh, with that, that mapping structure. Um, OK, so we have an index set up ready to receive events. Uh, actually adding the events at that point is pretty simple. You have an array of events, uh, and it's just JSON blobs again. Uh, the client is nice because you can do you can use date times and it does the right thing. And then uh, the simplest version is for just an iterator for every doc that you have, then dump it into Elasticsearch. Uh, this does make an HTTP request for every doc, so there are, are batch methods once you actually really want to put this into production. So that's an easy way to get up and running. Um, okay, so now we've got a, a bunch of documents in the index, the next bit is to pull stuff out of it. And uh, the easiest way to explain this, oh yeah, uh, sorry for the microscopic text. How, how horrible is that to the people in the back? I'll just speak louder. Um, <laughs> so the simplest building block uh, for pulling stuff back is, a, is this match all query. And it does exactly what you think. It's effectively the select star from the events table. It gets everything back in the order that you indexed it in. And, and you, you don't have to understand what is on the screen here. Uh, but uh, I'll provide these uh, notes on my Twitter account later. Uh, you can see it. Uh, but it, it gives you back what you'd expect. It tells you how much time the query took. It tells you if there's any errors. And obviously, importantly, it gives you all the hits back, uh, all the documents that match the query sorted by how well uh, they match the query. In the case of match all, uh, there is no notion of relevance, so you just get them back in, in the order that you index them. All right, so that, that was like the, the hello world of making a query. But there's a lot of different things you can do to craft the notion of relevance. What is an important document? What should match? What should not? And the, building, the smallest building block for these is the so-called term query. So if we have an index document, it's in a um, it's an uh, event in Nashville. Uh, if I wanted to make a filter over all the documents and only hit documents corresponding to the city Nashville, then that's a term query. Uh, I say this is a term, the field is city, the token is Nashville. The special thing about a term query is, uh, just like earlier where I said not analyzed, term means that this is just a token. 
Uh, it has to be capital N-A-S-H-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Does it do anything special? And so that, that's a match. But where it gets interesting and where you really get uh, a benefit uh, from a search engine is when you start incorporating this notion of, hey, this is not just a string. This is actually English text. And so if we have a, a sort of stupid document here, name equals filbert sorting for fun and profit, then a query that is not of type tech, uh, term but of type match actually applies that special knowledge about this is English. And so rather than looking for sort filbert the exact <coughs> tokens there, it knows that it, it can be lowercase. We can split on spaces. <coughs> uh, sorting and sort uh, should be basically the same information. And so that's a match. So compared to what you think about how you'd have to do that in MySQL, you would have to make a horrendous query to make that one simple match right there. And it would also be very poor per performing for reasons that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, getting more and more complicated because w your application has to have a lot of different ideas mixed together. Uh, you can do phrase matching. So not only uh, do we have the notion of matching documents that have these terms, but we want a document that has the term sorting and filbert in it in that order. This is not a match because the original document had filbert sorting. However, if we search for filberts space sort, that is a match despite the fact that it's different from the original document. Original document has uppercase and has uh, different parts of speech. But think about as a user looking for something, you don't quite remember the name of the movie, but you're probably going to get something like this. So getting these, these type of fuzzy matches is a specialty of search technology. Um, Filbert fun won't match because there's space between Filbert and fun. Just more example of how uh, match phrase works. But you can, you can add uh, this notion of slop. And everyone chuckles when I do that one. That's what it's called. Uh, you can add, add flop, slop. And uh, it'll find any document that has these two words within a space of two. And you can go nuts with this. I, I once had a, uh, a gig with a US patent office. And their search technology that they were getting rid of and moving to uh, a, a different search than Elasticsearch, Solar, uh, they really wanted to know, I want to find this word within the same sentence as some other word. And I want to find it before or uh, within like some number of words. And so you can take this same behavior and overload it and get some really complex uh, search behavior. But everything I've showed you to this point is just like atomic. It's like, I want this thing or that thing. Uh, you have to have a way of gluing these things together. In Elasticsearch, that is a Boolean query. Um, it, in normal notions of Boolean queries, uh, in normal notions of Boolean, you think ands and ors and nots. Uh, Elasticsearch has that but using different terminology. Rather than ands, we say must. Rather than should, uh, or, we say should. And then not is must not. So that one makes, makes pretty good sense. Uh, but the idea, uh, and, and if you play around with a few queries, you see why they move to th this terminology. Uh, usually, you have an array of things that must match. So in your Elasticsearch query, you have a must uh, key. And so you stick everything that must all these subclauses that must match there. And additionally, you have several things that don't have to match, but should match. If they could match, if you could find documents that also happen to have these other things, it should boost a little bit higher. So that's yet another array of things that if, if it matches, then you get a, a better score. Each one of these pieces, uh, you have the ability to also adjust weights. So we're starting to get into a notion of how search understands what's important to your customers and to your business. You can not only match documents that match their queries, but you can also boost documents that, um, that need, we need to sell quickly because they need to, they're expiring inventory or something like that. And, that. and that leads us to our next big topic, search relevance. I'm curious, uh, how many people here have heard of the notion of TF-IDF? OK, only this half of the room. That's interesting. 
Um, <laughs> you guys should have mixed in a little bit more. Uh, it's not a hard concept, um, and so I, I've, I, I think it's intimidating at first, but I, I can break it down pretty easily. This will be a little bit of a mathy slide, but not too bad. Um, first off, TF is really just means term frequency, and I'll get into that. And IDF means inverse document frequency. And the best way, rather than giving you the Webster's definition, the best way of explaining this is through, through an example. And let's say a user comes to your website and, and makes a search for the diddle. Now, that seems odd until you realize that one of the matching documents in your index is, hey, diddle, diddle, the cat in the fiddle. That's actually a pretty good match for it. So let's do a little practice round and see what this document would be scored as in it from the search engine's perspective. Term frequency is simply the number of times a term occurs in a document. So the TF for V in this case is two. There's the, the occurrence of V is twice. Similarly, just by coincidence, diddle also occurs twice. So TF for both of those guys is two. So far so good? Good. Uh, inverse document frequency. Uh, sometimes I just wish they called it document frequency and just put a one over it. It's Basically, how many number of times uh, the so the document frequency is how many number of times the term occurs not in this document but across the entire set of documents. So, document frequency for the pretty high. Uh, so the inverse document for the is just about zero. Makes sense. And the document frequency for diddle, not a very common word, is about it only occurs in seven documents. So it's actually very important, and it gets an inverse document score of 1 over 7, which is a lot, a lot, lot higher than 0. So when you finally are figuring out the total score of this document against this query, you, you uh, put all those pieces together. The score is the TF-IDF score for the plus the TF-IDF score for diddle. Uh, and you probably make sense, but just be a little bit redundant. Uh, TF of the is 2, IDF of the is 0, goes away. Uh, TF of diddle is one seventh, or is two, and IDF is uh, two seventh, and so you get the final result of 0.2857, blah, 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 blah. But the, but the idea is every document is going to go through the same process and be sorted, and so the way that you craft your query informs the way that this math works and the documents that, you know, you have 10,000 matches, but you want to make sure you do the right thing so the top 10 search results are what they want. Okay, yep, so that was, that was a pretty overloading uh, slide. I always like to take a break after heavy slides like that, and I think clay work is really therapeutic. And in particular, I think that this, this, is, this is my favorite <laughs> one. Ah, that's great. We're going to watch that one more time. <laughs> I love this part of this talk. Okay, service is a good break. So... To this point, how much time have I got left, by the way? So at this point, we've, we've done a lot uh, to get you in the mind space of how search works from a mechanical perspective, how to dump stuff in, how to pull stuff out, what it can do as compared to other uh, data stores like MySQL that I was picking on. Uh, the next thing that we want to do is dive inside the data store and give you a little of intuition about how the pieces inside work. And what you'll find is it's not that complicated. So uh, after this section, we'll, you'll have a little better understanding about when it's right to use Elasticsearch and when, when it's not. So uh, getting data in. In any data store, there's two main chunks that you have to understand, how you get data in and how you get data out. So that's, that's the outline for the next bit. The first step of getting data into Elasticsearch is a step called analysis. And basically, we're going to take a document, and in this case, I've got just one field out of a document, and I will show you how it effectively gets shredded and rearranged and shoved into uh, the data structures that make search technology so fast. Uh, our example in this case is the sentence, the conspirators conspire conspicuously. I chose it so that I could almost not pronounce it at a conference. Tokenization, that's the first step. Uh, in this case, uh, we have told Elasticsearch, hey, this is English. And that gives us some interesting uh, things that we can play off of. 
Uh, we know that English is split on white space and also punctuation. We can, we can basically throw out punctuation. An interesting side note that I always like to make here is this is not true of a lot of languages uh, in, on the other half of the earth, right? So like uh, my wife is Japanese. Uh, and so there are places where you could have symbols right next to each other and they're different words and the same thing, doing the same thing in Japanese, which you still have to do, you have to have a, a really complex algorithm to know where the best place is to split these things to make a logical sentence. So tokenization itself is a fairly deep topic. Uh, next step is actually a fairly shallow topic, lower casing. Uh, pretty easy, but uh, if, you, if you have someone type in lowercase, you, want, you better make sure that it matches a document on, in, uh, that has uppercase letters. Stop wording. Uh, a lot of the words in English are just noise words. They help us understand where things are placed relative to each other, but they don't really change the content. Uh, so we can throw away words like the and is and was and stuff like that. Uh, and perhaps my favorite step of analysis is stimming. Uh, this is another place where, because we've given Elasticsearch the hint that this is English, it knows some, some interesting tricks to do. Uh, if you want a document for farming to match uh, a query for farms, which is often the case, then effectively what stimming does accomplishes that. You can take a word and using a statistical technique, you can chop, effectively chop off and sometimes modify the end of these words to make tokens that are easier to match no matter what the intent was of the, the people searching. All right, the next step after analysis is indexing. So our example sentence has turned into these three tokens, conspire, conspire, conspicu. Sounds like Latin. Uh, let's say that this is document one. The, the secret sauce of Elasticsearch for being so fast is effectively during the indexing process, it takes these sentences, turns it into a bunch of tokens, and then it effectively transposes that. So instead of document one has these tokens, at the end of the analysis, when you've gone through all of your documents, you say, these tokens have these documents. So uh, document one had these tokens, but in the end, conspire appeared in document one, as well as these two other documents. Conspicu appeared in document one, as well as these three other documents. And so effectively, from a Python point of view, uh, you could implement this with a dictionary, uh, where the, the keys are tokens and the values are uh, an array of IDs. Now, this is, under the hood, this is actually implemented in Java, and they do a lot of uh, sneaky stuff. Uh, they shim extra information in the keys, so all the notions of document frequency, which we use for scoring, get shoved over into the, uh, the keys when you look stuff up. And all the notion of uh, term frequency, that's the other half of the TF-IDF, uh, are basically hidden into the values on the right, as well as other information like the positions of the words in the document so you can do phrase matches and stuff like that. But effectively, uh, a simple search engine is just a, a Python dictionary like that. All right, uh, so we have now gotten all the information into the index. The next half of the equation is getting information out of the index. So our inverted index looks like this, and um, yeah, make this uh, interactive. How would, given that data structure, what's the easiest way to find all documents that contain conspicuous and aardvarks? Anyone? Yep, that's all you have to do. Uh, effectively, you have uh, th these are lists, but they might as well be sets or iterators, and you find whichever one uh, IDs occur in both. Uh, and you can build arbitrarily complex things on the same idea, or is just a set union. Um, and if you combine a more complicated search, it's a set union followed by a different uh, set or uh, set intersection. Pretty easy. So, but that's only half the puzzle because MySQL is really good at finding documents that match. I just showed you how Elasticsearch finds documents that match efficiently, but uh, Elasticsearch has to turn around and do a sorting uh, algorithm that is, is part of the important aspect of search. When Google gives you back the 60,000 results it supposedly says you have for your query, you only see the top 10 and they're usually pretty good. If you scroll down 50,000 pages, they would probably be less good. 
Uh, so it's important to know how that works. Effectively, what happens is when your user gives you a query, you have an iterator of all the documents that match. And so what you do to find the top 10 is you initialize, a, you have a priority queue. Uh, do you all know roughly what a priority queue is? Okay. Um, we can talk about that. Uh, but effectively what you do is every document that comes through, you take it off of that iterator, you look at all the other secret stuff we've hidden in there and, and <coughs> find the score for that document. And now you put the document and that score on your priority queue. And there's something there that's just iterating, doing that with every single match that, that exists. The interesting aspect of this priori priority queue, though, is that it doesn't keep up with every document it ever sees. It's only of length 10 or whatever you tell it to be. So as, as soon as you get past you know, uh, the top 10 documents, you've, you've got one that uh, scores lower than the documents, then it, it compares itself to not even 10, like you know, it's log, order log in or whatever. It compares it to a few of the documents and says, I'm lower than all these. Never think of me again. And so the, ac the action is actually uh, pretty efficient. Now there's a little side note. This is another intuition that might be important for Elasticsearch. If you're doing some sort of relevance, but you also want to return 100% of the documents, think about how you'd implement that. If I want to, deep paging is what it's called. If you've got a robot scanning your website for the 10,000th to 10,010th most fun event, then this means that you have to have a priority queue that is 10,010 long, and you sort all the documents in, throw away the first 10,000 of them, and give that chunk back. And guess what happens when the, doc when the robot goes to the next page carelessly? It just gets worse and worse and worse. So that's one important in intuition to think about in search technology. Uh, Elasticsearch allows you to turn that off so you, uh, if, you, if you don't care about relevance. But if you do, I would recommend not letting anyone get past about uh, 500 results. All right, and then I already said it returns the, the, the most high priority contents from that queue. That's effectively what we do. Like after top 10, they go away. The, the data structure is only 10 items long, so it can't hold any more than that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not a bad idea. If, uh, I don't know how I would implement that in Elasticsearch. I don't think they make that easy for you. But yeah, that, that totally checks out. Um, all right. OK, so I need a little transition slide. Here. But effectively, that gets us through everything that a search engine has been until about three years ago. But Elastic, so search came out of information retrieval, library technology type stuff, finding whatever I wanted to find. Uh, but Elasticsearch uh, has started to prove the point really strongly that the, the same data structures that serve uh, search results are actually really good for online analysis, log parsing, stuff like that. And a big chunk of that is its ability to do aggregations. And I think I can convince you that it's, uh, it's basically what we're doing before, just one extra step, and you get this uh, nice ability to do aggregations for free, almost. Um, so just like before, whenever we're aggregating over the, you know, we want to find the, the, uh, a histogram of the ticket prices or something like that. We have all the results that we had from before. We do the sorting like we did with them before, but while we still get that document in hand, we push it through an aggregator. It's basically a, a, just a little in-memory thing that says, OK, uh, how many documents have I seen in, you know, from $10 to $20? And it just uh, increments those counters. Uh, for every document, it does this. And at the end of it, you pass back this aggregator thing, and you have these really nice uh, results. And it was just something that you did almost as a byproduct of the actual search itself. So with the building blocks that I, I've given you right now, you, you can see how we have the ability to easily filter. That's just what a search is. You can group stuff, because you can see as the documents are coming through, you can already figure out which group it belongs to. And within each group, you can do calculations to do running averages or anything like that. Um, so uh, to give you a little more intuition about how you might use aggregation, here is how I encountered it for the first time. Uh, let's say you go to Amazon. You're chuckling. Have you, have you seen my? That top book, by the way, is a really excellent book. <laughs> I can just. Um, so anyway, this, if you go to uh, e-commerce sites, you see a lot of uh, the original use for aggregations. 
uh, is they were called uh, facets, faceted search. You have a list of subcategories on the side. You have the counts for how many things are in that category. You can click on it, and it serves as a filter. It gives you a little bit of what I call relevance feedback, so you can understand what's actually happening. But people have taken the same data structure. You turn it on its side, and you've got really nice histograms, which at Eventbrite, uh, we're making them prettier now, but you can use them to feedback uh, good information about how many tickets are sold from a particular class. Uh, you can take exactly the same information, but a different data set, and give spark charts for how many tickets were sold in a particular day. And you could take, the, again, counts over buckets, and you can plot it on a map, and you've got a really nice, nice geo information console just to give you intuition about where things are happening in geospatial relationship. And finally, uh, it's, I, I don't know exactly how to make a picture for it, but uh, analytics, uh, log analytics in particular, are great with Elasticsearch. Building Elasticsearch, uh, building aggregations in Elasticsearch is easy. I'm going to kind of fly through this so I have a couple questions. But effectively, all you have to do is you have your normal query. You keep asking your query like normal, but you add a new section to your, uh, your query to Elasticsearch called ags. And in this particular case, it's going to be hard to read, so I, I'll blur over it. Uh, but you say you can say things like, my ag aggregations, I want you to do counts for how counts grouped by city. So that's a, a term aggregation where the field is city. And I also want you to do a histogram aggregation uh, for the prices with an interval of 10. So that's the second thing. The results come back, and you have the normal search results at the very top, but you have a new section that has these these uh, aggregations in it. In this case, I've uh, got the city bucket right there with my Nashville and Dallas and BFE events. Uh, and I've got my price buckets uh, for you know what distribution uh, of events occurred. But a neat thing that you can do, so right now, I, I really needed a graphic for this. Right now, I've got two separate aggregations. A neat thing for us to provide back to our users is not only the histogram of all the events, but we could do a histogram per each city. And you can do this with Elasticsearch. You, aggregations can be arbitrarily nested. There's performance issues after, after some point. But I can say, at the top level, uh, do a terms aggregation. So we bucket everything by city, and I get the counts back. And then within e that aggregation, do a histogram so that we can show our users, here's the price uh, distribution within the city that you're interested in. Uh, the results turn uh, come back. Very similar structure, except it's appropriately nested so that for each city bucket, you have the count. And within that, you have sub buckets for the histogram so that you can draw it on the screen. That's effectively it. Uh, I've been doing this a while, so I have a lot, of, a lot of things to learn, but a lot of other things that I would enjoy talking about. Um, also, if you're interested in learning more on your own, I know of a, some reading material. Um, and and uh, you know, find me on Twitter. Tell me, tell me what I did right and what I did wrong. Anyway, that that's it. Uh, what have you guys got? Any any questions? So repeating questions, I guess, right? Uh, the, the question was around how do we deal, we can specify English or not, but how do we deal with uh, unknown terms, different languages, jargon terms, stuff like that? Um, the easy answer is you still just say uh, it's English if it's basically English. And uh, you still get the ability to split on white space and all that stuff, because that's presumably where you might come from. I'll go to the other extreme in a second. Uh, and you, uh, you still do stimming. Uh, which means if it's like maybe a verb, but it's a verb I haven't heard before, stimming actually does pretty well for English-like things. I mean, but uh, the, if if you're willing to put the work in it, you have an arbitrary amount of control over what you can do. 
So uh, at the other extreme uh, end of things, uh, I mean, I guess you could write your own Java. It's all pluggable. It's just uh, Lucene, Java Lucene. Uh, you could write your own uh, classes to do whatever custom logic you want. Uh, if you don't want to go quite that far, there are other kind of middle uh, ground things like uh, synonyms. You can say, you know, as a preprocessing step before you uh, do the semi and chop off and throw away the ends of the words, you can, you can say, here's a file of every jargon word you might see. And you can either say, don't touch it for the downstream stuff, or you can say, you know, this maps to three other words, or these three words map to one word. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, about what you can do to tune that relevance notion. But it might be a lot of work. He had a question first. No. You, yes and no. Um, part of that is the, not only do we hi hide the term frequency that counts for each one of those terms that they occurred in the documents, but we also hide uh, a few other small things that we stick next to the tokens. Uh, we hide its position in the document, uh, which, which gets to your answer about phrases. And you can also hide, there's a couple other things that aren't used as often, but like you can hide part of speech there if you have that set up. And you can hide a payload, which you can do whatever you want to with. Uh, you can boost on documents that have certain words in it a little bit higher. Uh, but it, it's still there. Uh, one thing you can't do, though, is, re is make a search and reassemble it into the original document from this data structure. That's why whenever you store a document in Elasticsearch, it gets shredded, turned into that, and at the same time, you have a different uh, file on disk that's pulled in the memory that reads the original document out. So you're effectively storing it twice every time. Um, you talked a little bit about what the, what the document is doing at an Eventbrite and how and what it's storing on the server. A document at Eventbrite is an event. Um, and it, it has what I call the boring field that, that are expected, uh, the name, description, the date, uh, geolocation, which actually that gets interesting. Uh, but we also have, uh, this is in progress, but we're working on interesting fields like machine learning things like event cluster that we can later match up with a user cluster that comes in, or event quality, which is another thing that we're inferring from the metadata around it. Uh, so those are all things that Elasticsearch is happy of, uh, with dealing with. And, and then there's not too much more than that that's like mind-blowing from departure from what I showed here. It's Elasticsearch. This is a data structure. It's a, yeah, JSON record that's, we do exactly that thing with it. Elastic, hand it to Elasticsearch and make it queryable. Elasticsearch stores both. Uh, like connector type things. We rolled our, uh, when I was in SolarLand, uh, the predecessor sort of to Elasticsearch, there was a lot of plugins where you could connect them. I forget what they call pipeline thing, ETL. Uh, there are some of those for Elasticsearch, but we ended up just rolling our own because we wanted control over it. So not a very specific answer. One more. I think he had his hand up first, but please talk to me later. So Jane. Really cool uh, question. Uh, a really cool benefit of Elasticsearch is it's a, a write-only uh, index. So segments on disk effectively are never touched again. But the caveat is when you actually change a field, what you do is you go back, find that record where it uh, used to be written, read out the entire document, change that one field, and write it to a new segment file. And the only place you can change the old file is you mark one bit is dead, tombstone it. So, not great, but but it's a trade-off. You get benefits for treating it that way. Definitely not a table scan. It's 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 still pretty quick. Cool. So I have exactly zero minutes left. Please come back, talk to me later, and thank you very much for coming.